I'm Michael Alexander, the director of City Conversations. City Conversations is presented by SFU's Public Square. Our thanks to uh, SFU Vancouver, to Bing Tom Architects, uh, and to the SFU City Program and Wild Rice. All of those are our sponsors, and we are very grateful for their support in helping to make this, uh, this series possible. Anybody here who has not been to a City Conversations before? Ah, okay. You are not an audience. These are not speakers. These are presenters, and you are participants. The point of this is to encourage conversation. So their presentations are going to be very brief, and we will open up most of the uh, most of the hour to your questions, your observations, your questioning of each other, as well as as to as to the presenters. It's about the conversation. Uh, and that's most of the time. This is kind of a formal lecture room. Uh, uh, we understand that that's what's available to us. As I think was very generous in providing us uh, space. But please, if you brought your lunch, feel free to eat your lunch. But please unwrap your sandwich now. And uh, and. You can multitask, you can meet and talk at the, uh, at the same time. Uh, to introduce today's program, last year, the International Journal of Drug Policy published this study uh, on the economic impact of legalizing uh, marijuana in British Columbia. Also last year, the Union of BC Municipalities voted to decriminalize marijuana, something which is a bit different than you'll, and I'm sure you'll hear about that distinction. Uh, they did not, however, vote to legalize it. Late last year, in November, two American states, Washington and Colorado, legalized marijuana's recreational use and sale. 17 U.S. states and the District of Columbia in the United States permit medicinal use. Is the prohibition policy that has uh, dominated uh, uh, drug use, uh, is that starting to wane? What's next for our province, the home of BC Bud? To frame this conversation, we are really, really pleased and honored to have the Honorable Cash Heat MLA from Vancouver uh, Fairview, and SFU's Professor Donald McPherson, the director of the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition and the author of Vancouver's Groundbreaking Four Pillars Drug Strategy. Going to go to the two of you. Well, <clears throat> certainly uh, I've been called better things than honorable. I'm, not, I'm really not that honorable, okay? <laughs> yes, I'm a senior politician right now. Right now, but in a few months, I'm not going to be. There's reason why I'm here. Uh, I was a police officer for 31 years, also. The majority of my time was spent in Vancouver, which you're going to learn more about uh, in the experiences we had here in Vancouver. And uh, part of that time was spent in a, as a commanding officer of the drug unit in Vancouver and as a commanding officer of the uh, gang task force that we have operating in Vancouver. And we all know what's going on around the gang violence right now. Four people shot in my home community of Richmond uh, overnight. So uh, it's certainly a perpetuating problem that we need to address. Now, I just want to say a little bit about Donald and I, because we've got a bit of a dynamic happening here. I met Donald when I was a young uh, supervisor, uh, a corporal, working in the downtown east side of Vancouver. And Donald was the director of the Carnegie Community Center. And uh, you know, we were kind of like, you know, I'm the big tough cop and he's the big social worker in the community. And you know, we we're like this, but I'll tell you, we actually ended up like this. Like very, very close friends. We've socialized together. We've actually traveled to New York together at about this time a few years ago to talk about this specific issue and drug policy in general at the New York Academy of Medicine. And uh, 
we've also been to LA and uh, elsewhere to, to talk about this issue. So it's been a long-standing uh, issue that Donald and I have shared for many, many years from our diverse background. And we uh, certainly are passionate about making the changes uh, on this. What, what turned me? I blame it on the fact that I went to SFU and finished my undergrad degree and then went on into a graduate program. But now I'm a, 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 an adjunct professor here teaching in the uh, School of Criminology uh, on a sessional contract. But just to give you a little bit of background, especially from my policing point of view, and why I'm taking such a passionate and prominent position on marijuana policy and drug policy in general in Canada. I just want you to watch this video. It's only about a five minute video. It's up on YouTube and uh, hopefully I can get this up and working. Yeah, it's a bit of an introduction uh, for myself. Shootings and gang violence have grown exponentially in recent years. Abbotsford police say the gang problem has more than doubled in five years. We are not having any success on marijuana prohibition in Canada. My mother said to me uh, when I was very, very young, to do the right thing, not the popular thing. It's very difficult for police officers to come out and say that the war on drugs has been a failure. From day one in the academy, we were taught as police officers that the way to deal with problems is to arrest people and put people in jail. And even myself as a young officer starting in 1979 believed that we could arrest our way out of this particular problem. But over the years, as I went forward in my law enforcement career, um, I realized that years and years and years of spending money on enforcing prohibition for drugs uh, has been a failure. And that is the feeling with many, many police leaders, but they publicly will not say it until they leave policing because the culture will eat you up. And I have experienced this. They labeled me as not being one of them. It's been an advocate for the drug user. Drug dealers are regulating marijuana right now. It's easier for our youth right now to go out and buy marijuana than it is to purchase alcohol and cigarettes. We need to start thinking long term. Number one is dealing with the issue of marijuana and ending prohibition and taxing the revenue that can come from marijuana. There is absolutely no way we will deal with our drug problems, with our current policies, simply because there is far too much money to be made selling illicit drugs in this world. When I was a commanding officer of the drug unit, we had record-breaking interdiction uh, of drugs here in Vancouver. We had record-breaking arrests. And we quickly realized that it did not make one iota of difference and the price did not change by one cent. And we found an increase in violence simply because the void has to be filled. People will get involved in the trade to make a lot of money because it is still illegal. The great demand for marijuana produced in British Columbia is the United States. So if the gangs can get their product to the United States, they can use that money to purchase cocaine to bring it back here into BC to even triple their profits. It's criminal organizations that are benefiting from uh, the prohibition of drugs, especially the prohibition of marijuana here in British Columbia. The gang situation in Metro Vancouver is very, very serious. And we've had an excess of 300 people killed uh, based on this uh, uh, prohibition of marijuana and the fact that they're getting involved in it to make some easy money. And uh, they're not going to think twice about uh, taking out someone in order for them to make more of a profit. If we 
continue with our current drug policies in Canada, we will have an increasing rate of gang violence in our communities. I'm in the political world right now. The hypocrisy is rampant. We, as citizens of Canada, need to stand up and advocate for contemporary drug policies. Let's end marijuana prohibition. Let's stop the violence that's taking place here in British Columbia. Let's end it now by ending prohibition. service announcements that have not hit the air yet. So Stop the Violence BC is the reason I have come out so strongly in the last few months. Uh, this is an unbelievable organization. If you have an opportunity to go to their website, check out uh, what's going on. These are law enforcement professionals. These are former attorney generals, former uh, premiers of this province, uh, judges, uh, prosecutors, Jody, I know you're sitting there, and I gotta admit, the one that put Mark away, he's part of Stop the Violence BC and came up publicly uh, to stop the insanity that uh, we have in place right now. And, uh, you know, Jody, I gotta give credit to you, is uh, you've held me honest over the last little while, so, uh, um, you know, thank you very much. But uh, um, I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm gonna turn it over to my cohort here, Donald McPherson, to see if we can break you guys up after that. Scared the hell out of me, though. That's quite Waking me up. I think everyone's awake. I'm gonna try and calm us down. Um, what, uh, and it, it, I love the format because for the presenters, we don't have to worry about making a presentation. We'll stay up all night. So I'm going, well, my background is, as, as Cash said, I was the director of the Carnegie Community Center in Van Hastings from 87 to 97, knew nothing about drug policy. I was a literacy person, uh, supported the Carnegie Center, the literacy center there, knew nothing really, aside from the fact that I was 20 in 1972. So I caught the tail end of the 60s, and so I have my own experience of what I would call recreational harmless uh, cannabis use in the, in the good old days. Um, but I became really passionate about drug policy because of what was going on in the corner of Van uh, which was a devastating uh, drug scene uh, where people were dying. People were dying in the corner of Van Hastings, they were dying in the back alleys. In 1994, chief, uh, the, the chief coroner of BC, Vince Kane, uh, traveled the province uh, on a sort of one-man, one-person task force on overdose, uh, heroin overdose deaths in British Columbia. 400 people died in, uh, the, in the province that year, in 93. 200 people died in Vancouver, and all through the 90s, if people remember, and some of you I know, around the downtown east side at that time, it was a devastating decade in the downtown east side. Hundreds and hundreds. Uh, there were 2,000 crosses in Oppenheimer Park events put on by Van Du and the Fort Hotel Society to commemorate the thousands of people who died of overdoses. A couple years later, they did it again. And uh, it went on and on and on and on and on, and nothing seemed to happen. It was like a state of emergency. The Vancouver Richmond Health Board had, had, had called a public health emergency. Uh, so, so for my entry into drug policy was my personal use of cannabis way back when and throughout my life. But I was really, you know, learning about the, the, the real hard end of it, the death, despair, severe addiction, mental health, and the, the, the toll in bodies. And what stunned me working at the corner of Maine Hastings is how this went on year after year after year even though emergencies were declared, there was no emergency response. And the emergency was declared the HIV epidemic in 1996 among addiction drug users, uh, a public health emergency declared in 97, people kept dying. So I became really incensed and passionate about why can't we change the situation? And I came to the conclusion that drug prohibition is driving so much of uh, what's going on. I'm just going, and the other part of me, when I, when I responded to your email, was like, 
cannabis regulation. What about it? Well, it's it's time. It's time. Uh, this is just some excerpts from the Consumers Union Report in 1972. Uh, Edward Brecker and the editors of Consumer Reports magazine did a very, very thorough look at all of the commissions that have been that looked at cannabis and, uh, and the criminalization of prohibition of cannabis. The Indian Hemp Drugs Commission Report 1894, the Panama Canal Zone Military Investigation 1916 to 29, LaGuardia Committee Report 1939 to 44. The Baroness Wooten Report uh, in the UK, 1967, and they've chosen to talk about the Lodane Commission in 1972 because it, it represents much of the conclusions of all these other reports. So that's 1972, we were on the precipice. Uh, Lodane uh, recommended, among other things, uh, uh, of getting rid of the prohibition for possession of cannabis. And so we were on the precipice of that in Canada, and the, and the commission itself, um, it held 21 days of formal hearings in 12 Canadian cities from coast to coast, traveling 17,000 miles. 12,000 Canadians had attended these formal and informal hearings up to February 1st, 1970. And as a result of the initial phase of its inquiry, the commission is more than ever convinced that the proper response to the non-medical use of psychotropic drugs is a question which must be worked out by the people of Canada, examining it and taking it over, taking it over altogether. It goes to the roots of our society and touches the values underlying our whole approach to life. It is not a matter which can be confined to the discreet consultation of experts, although experts obviously have their role and a very important one to play. And the organization I'm involved in now, which is the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition, where we're located upstairs with the uh, partnering with the Center for Applied Research and Mental Health and Addiction. We're a coalition of organizations and individuals across Canada who want to create a new drug policy for Canada, the one that's based on, on evidence, public health, human rights, um, and social inclusion. Our drug laws have, over the years, have not, not done that. Um, and what we're seeing, our, our drug laws have been punitive, they haven't worked to control uh, illegal markets, uh, they've been exclusionary, uh, they've pushed people to the side, and that's what I saw in, uh, in downtown Vancouver. There were 60,400, I believe, police incidents around cannabis possession in Canada uh, this past year, uh, in 2011, sorry, up 17% from 2002 and up, uh, I think, 7% from 2010. I, I noticed that figure. A couple of days ago when Vic Paves, our Minister of Justice, was in Ottawa saying that policing costs are unsustainable in Canada. And who, who bears the cost of policing in Canada? People who live in cities, mostly. Uh, I don't know how big the budget for the VPD is, but what do cities do? They pay for police, they pay for fire. Those are huge budgets in the fire department. So the huge budgets. So, I just found it odd because there's 60,400 incidents, police incidents around cannabis in Canada in 2011. What, what was that all about? Imagine the police cost if 75% if, if, uh, of those resulted in arrests, etc. So, there's, I mean, there's so much to say, there's so much evidence that we have from starting way back when in 1894 with these commissions, so the Dane Commission. Um, so many commissions have arrived at the same results. It was ironic in 1972 when uh, Richard Nixon started the war on drugs, which took our, took our attention away and, and sort of put, put drugs as the problem. And I wake up and what happened then? We were so close to having a same drug policy 50, 40 years, was it 40 or 50 years ago, 40 years ago? I guess we were so close to having that in 72, what happened? It was like someone snatched it away from us and we went on a bender of uh, uh, police and enforcement spending um, that has gotten us to where we are today <coughs> with shootings happening in Vancouver, 60 to 70,000 people dying in Mexico because of the drug cartel and the war on drugs there. Uh, more drug use, according to the Global Commission on Drug Policy, than ever before. Cannabis is the most popular drug used globally. 
we have now, I think, the benefit of more research on harms of cannabis, but we have way more research on the benefits of cannabis. And, the, and so to, to treat a substance that is used in such, with such prevalence in global society, North American society, uh, in a way that causes so much harm to young people, uh, criminal records, uh, gang violence, gang recruitment, uh, and a substance we know so much more of, about and is clearly much safer. I'm not saying it's totally harmless, but it's much safer than alcohol. It's much safer than tobacco. So our, our, and it was made illegal with no evidence from science at all. And it, it back in the 20s, I believe it was, but was there a period? 22, was it? And the whole set up. And based on a whole set of fabricated stories about its harms. So we know that. And, and we, would, <coughs> we would hope we would make public policy with no evidence and based on fabricated stories today. So it really is time uh, to, to move, to step back and say, one minute. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> it's really time to step back, and our organization would like Canadians to pick up where the game left off and have a conversation and arrive at a sane policy for Canadians around. Back. I don't know. I think the difference between uh, 1920, 1970, 2010 marijuana. Yes. The material itself. Marijuana, first of all, is, as we know, it's a natural plant. Okay? It, it grow in, you can grow it in this room if you want. You can grow it anywhere. It's a natural plant. It's not like the other drugs, which the majority of those drugs go through the process. What we have is, is the way the plant is uh, actually grown. Is it, you know, the, the largest changes of the THC level between, uh, especially the seventh, the one that I'm aware of, the 70s to where we are now. And, but still, when we looked at the average THC when I was in the drug unit, was still only around 8 to 9 percent. In the 70s, we had about 3 to 4 percent. I don't know what it was in the 20s. But we have incidents now where, where the Health Canada has actually looked at the THC level of some of the marijuana that's been seized by the police, and it's been excessive. It's been in the 20 or 30 percent range. And that's part of the argument why we want to go to a, a regulated system where we will actually be able to control what goes in the marijuana that's sold. Similar to the way we control what goes into a cigarette and what goes into liquor that's sold at the, at the liquor store. We control the amount of nicotine, we control the amount of alcohol that goes into it, and we want to do the same thing about the regulation of marijuana, where we'll be able to control what's in the cigarettes. So that's the, uh, the answer. Do you have anything further, John? Well, no, it's just a, it, 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 behind your question, um, the pot of today is different than the pot of yesterday, so therefore it's more dangerous, and therefore we have to prohibit it. Is that, is that behind your question, or is it just, just a straight because, that's, no, because that's a very... No, no preconceived uh, no, position. It, it, it's one of the arguments. So, well, you know, the pot that I smoked when I was 20 in 1972 was different now, so we can't legalize that pot. So, but of course, the counter argument is cash is we produce higher strength pot because it's prohibited. Um, Okay, there was a question over here, and then uh, here, here. Yes. Yeah, you, you mentioned Richard Nixon during your presentation, and it seems to me that the prohibition policy was entrenched, the culture was entrenched at that time, and it persists. There's a change in administration in the U.S., obviously. But how much of this is really driven politically between the states, uh, like five years ago, and federal policy now? Let me repeat the question, uh, or one of you, if you repeat the question so we can pick it up uh, on, uh, on the recorder. Uh, the, the question is that uh, uh, how much of the uh, issue is political now? F federal policy in Canada or the states? Well, it seems to me that the federal policy of Canada is probably dictated by what's going on. Right. 
Well, I, as part of the work I'm doing now, I attend the Commission on Narcotic Drugs in Vienna, which happens every year. It's when all the countries come together, about 180, 90 delegations, and they look at the International Drug Treaties, which have come forward in three iterations over the, the, the last 50 years, beginning in 61 with the single convention. Um, and it's uh, until very recently, I would say, I would say until Obama, the, the American delegation changed under Obama somewhat. Until, until Obama, the American delegation would roll into Vienna, a fleet of them, they would open their laptops, and they would start looking at resolu resolutions that might be changing things, even around methadone or syringe exchange, and they'd start deleting. And they start deleting from the resolutions, and then they'd make deals with various countries, and the resolution may go forward, and it may, may have some positive elements to it, but what would be deleted would be things like harm reduction, which you still cannot find in those meetings, the language is not there. You, so, so yes, the American, American policy uh, has driven Canadian policy for some time. If you ask, I've spoken to senators who, you know, is there pressure from the U.S. on Canadian drug policy? Yes, it's immense pressure. I've been in the Minister of Finance's office under uh, uh, Prechen, uh, under Mark. Well, we wouldn't want to do anything, you know, like this is Larry Campbell with mayor. We wouldn't want to do anything that would cause the Americans to close their borders. So, yes, it's it immense. And, and you say that to our American colleagues and they say, well, that's ridiculous. The northern states would go crazy. You know, they would be losing all this economy from us Canadians. The, so it's, it's these, these threats. They're not going to close their borders because we decriminalize cannabis. Uh, or, or now, because if we legalize cannabis, because they're ahead of us now. So, but that changed under Obama to some extent. Just let me make one, one further comment because there's a couple of very important issues that have come up in that question. Number one, it's, it's, it's very political. But you look at what's going on in the United States right now. They are further left on their policies, especially Washington and Colorado, under uh, 64 and 502, than the Netherlands. They are further left than the Netherlands. And their political leaders, the governors of both of those states, who were against those amendments and the initiative said that they are going to defend what their constituents want and they have been talking to the Obama administration to make sure that they do not intervene in what the citizens want. And I honestly think the Obama administration won't intervene. But all the other administrations, right back to Richard Nixon, reinforce failure, the failed metaphor of the war on drugs. Reinforced it. It was highly political, and they got political positions, they got votes by taking that position. But things are changing, and we will follow suit, in my opinion. Any questions? Thank you. Or here? Yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Williams. I've been a <clears throat> cannabis reform activist for about 15 years here in the city. I'd like to speak to the notion that marijuana has become stronger than it used to be. first joint I smoked was in 1969. The last one I smoked was a half hour ago. And I stand here before you and tell you emphatically it has not gotten stronger. In fact, it has gotten weaker. The idea <clears throat> that a bunch of hippies hiding from the police can make a plant super is beyond <coughs> my belief. You can't do it with corn without years and years and years of total scientific research. Marijuana is not stronger. Prohibition has told us that it's stronger. They don't really have a test to test this. And it doesn't really matter. Marijuana is not that strong. It's not as strong as alcohol. It's not as strong as a lot of substances. People are not coming forward being hurt by it. No matter what one says about the strength, no matter what one says about what went into it to create it. This is a natural plant that's grown, and it creates what it creates by itself. We have not aided that in any way. None. 
Thank you. Uh, here and then there was here and over there. Yes. Uh, here first. Yes. So I guess I'd like to hear from both speakers a little more substance about what it is that that's being proposed. So how would how would marijuana be manufactured? How would it be distri distributed? How would it be sold? So what is it that we're really talking about here? Okay, the question is how would man uh, marijuana, a little more specific, how would marijuana be manufactured? How would it be sold? How would it be regulated? That, that, from my perspective, that's the discussion we need to be having. Um, oh, there, are, there are a lot, what, what do we do with, with things we put in our body? We regulate them. We know how to regulate products. We regulate food. We, re we regulate the height of these tables. And we are regulate, a regulatory society. So the discussion that we want to get to is not whether to. Let's get beyond that. It's the how to. Do we want Rothmans and De Maurier to have cannabis? Probably not. Um, there are all sorts of models that we have to bring people together and, and talk about. There, there's so much expertise out there globally around producing, uh, manufacturing, producing. We're going to see different retail models spring up in the states. Uh, these two states. So that that's a discussion that we want to begin to have, and we can and well and it won't be pretty. There'll be you know there'll be all sorts of folks from the left to the right who will quibble about how much regulation and all, all those sorts of things. But that's a discussion that we really need to have. Right now. So well, cash I, may cash may have well, a perfect well, system. Well, well, no, actually, <laughs> well, I, I don't know what the purpose is. We're not going to know until we try it and then make it as, as good as we can make it. But I've been uh, asked this question a lot, and I had this very conservative group in Ontario ask me this, uh, this question. And uh, <clears throat> probably the most extensive work has been done in Washington State on what it would look like. And we're talking about the adult use of small amounts of marijuana. And I, th I think it's, it's usable, uh, one ounce is, is I've, I've got it here, as a look. One exact usable one ounce. The adult use for recreational purposes. It's still going to be illegal for uh, compared to uh, alcohol is 21 years. It's still going to be illegal for someone under 21 years uh, to actually uh, have it in their possession or to consume it, similar to alcohol. But they will then license the producers through a regulatory system. It'll all be controlled the way they control uh, liquor through liquor uh, control board. Uh, in Washington State, uh, they will have uh, you know, uh, uh, intoxication laws in place. I think they're going at five nanograms of THC. So if you're over five nanograms while driving, well, you're impaired by drugs at that particular point. There's technology right now that's being developed uh, where they'll be able to detect it without a blood test. Uh, for example, at the roadside. Um, what else can I tell you about it? It'll be sold the same way we sell liquor uh, there. It'll still be, for example, uh, in Washington State, unless you have a special permit, you cannot consume liquor in public places unless there's licenses or permits. It's, a, it's the same concept we'd be looking at here. Colorado is looking at a similarity. Colorado may do a bit of a different distribution because they have such a large medicinal marijuana population and uh, uh, distribution down there, they may be looking at, at the, uh, molding that together somehow uh, for that. But the simplest way to explain it that I use to explain to people, even extreme right conservatives, and, and they really get it, is the fact that it will be uh, 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 administered, regulated, the same way we regulate alcohol uh, here in the province. And that's what I've been arguing for and taking the tax dollars and earmarking that money, earmarking that money for specific programs, whether it be drug treatment, whether it be drug prevention, whether it be health care, whether it's education, not putting that into general revenue. Other questions? Here, and then back over, over here, and then I'll work uh, over to the side. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. First, I want to say that Um, my question is about uh, jurisdiction. 
implementation and policy implementation. And in light of what the Harper government did with Insight and how that went to the Supreme Court and it was ruled that healthcare because it falls under the province so they could still have it, clearly Harper has made it clear and the Conservative Party has made it clear that they would not support anything along those lines. I'm wondering how you guys envision the jurisdiction and getting this policy through. Like, would you be going through the province for healthcare kind of aspect or would you be trying to get the Canadian criminal code changed? So the question is, uh, how do you how do you deal with the jurisdictional issues between the different levels of government? Well, we know the excuse that uh, you know the premier of this province and other uh, provincial politicians have used in saying that you know, oh, it's a federal issue. They don't even want to comment on it, which is a bunch of hogwash, as far as I'm concerned. If you t if you we may have to wait. Let me, let me start it off by saying, we may have to wait until there's a change in government in Ottawa to change the Control of Drugs and Substances Act. Uh, that may be uh, what we have to do. But let me just go back to Donald. Uh, I'm sure you can, you can carry on with this because Donald and I were part of arguing for Insight, the supervised injection site in the downtown east side. I remember when I came out in a report to the police board when I was planning out to the drug unit, that we should go with a trial run of that. They thought I was a loon within the police department. They were ready to, you know, chuck me out of my butt. Um, and I think the same thing with Donald, uh, you know, within the city. But then we elected a, uh, I think, a municipal government based on one issue. And that was the argument for this, uh, the injection site. But Donald and I traveled to Ottawa several times because we were making an argument for an exemption under Health Canada in order for that site to operate. And when we look at the success we had there, this is something that can be tried on the marijuana issue here in the province of British Columbia, where we go through the Health Council and all those leaders and ask for that exemption to run a pilot here in British Columbia. I mean, I, I, I don't have, I tend to agree that change probably won't, significant change won't come under a conservative government, uh, or under a Harper government anyway. I do think though that uh, all governments are going to notice that public opinion around this issue is growing and growing and growing. It's not a losing issue, it's a winning issue as a politician. And that and once that flips, as we saw with Insight and Larry Campbell, I mean, once that flips, then you know, it, it becomes much less of a political issue and more of a how to do it issue, a regulatory issue. And that's where, that's where the debate really gets interesting because there's no guarantee we're going to get the system we want, right? Uh, depending on who's in his power. And the, and the states having gone the way they've gone is really helpful. I mean, it's just so helpful. I mean, it's just the beginning of the end of prohibition of cannabis. And, but I'm, and there, there are ways, as Cash was saying, there are options, sensible BC, which someone may say something about, is a, is a project trying to look at a way to remove criminal penalties from, from a cannabis possession uh, to take place in BC. So we're looking for ways, but it's, it's tough if you have a federal government that's going to fight you every each of the way. Gentlemen, I'll skip Uh, my comment goes back <clears throat> a little bit. Uh, when you mentioned um, uh, classifying the weed uh, and the different percentages of it, and then saying that uh, you'd use a regulatory system on the weed to, uh, you know, control the amount of THC, I, I assume. Um, do you have any evidence that the THC actually is the harmful part of, uh, you know, cannabis? And also, uh, any ideas about regulating the hundreds of other cannabinoids that also affect the high. Uh, and then when you mentioned uh, that uh, we know how to regulate, I think that came from both of you, and Nate, you mentioned the tobacco companies. Um, if we know how to regulate the tobacco companies, why is it full of uh, cancer-causing uh, stuff that is essentially a nicotine uh, delivery system, as they put it? So I kind of like, it, before we start to uh, uh, you know, regulate cannabis, maybe we ought to regulate the way we regulate. 
<laughs> just, just wondering what you think about you know, the corruption in the regulation system as it is in pertains to tobacco, and this is, would be very similar to that. So I guess the question is, in broad terms, uh, is the regulatory system uh, up to the task? Is uh, do we know enough about the, about the chemistry uh, to be able to regulate it uh, properly? We, I have a colleague uh, named Alec Wodak. He's in Australia. He's a long-time advocate for, for cannabis. And he quotes Winston Churchill on this one. You know, Winston Churchill, you know, the least, the, the least worst form of government, you know, with, with democracy. Mm. You know. So what we're looking for is the least worst form of regulation of drugs. Prohibition is the worst form. We have all of the evidence to show that. And that's why, I mean, it's going to get interesting when we try and actually do this regulatory stuff because we met, we, we screw up with pharmaceutical products. You mentioned alcohol, I mean, the, the tobacco. We allow massive alcohol advertising targeting young people to drink. Why do we do that? We, we don't regulate alcohol well. So the, the, the real, but as long as we don't get to the how-to, we're never going to, we're going to learn the best ways to regulate cannabis. You, you, you want me to just respond? I, sure, yeah, that'd be good. I, 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 I wouldn't, I'm trying to be as practical as I can. If we have thrown this argument, you know what, we need to look at what we're doing with tobacco first. We'll never get to what we need to do with marijuana. We will never get to it. I'm trying to reach some middle ground to make sure that we're able to change drug policy here. And, and you know, at one time, the middle ground for me, sir, was decriminalization. And I realized that decriminalization, we've got de facto decriminalization taking place right now. I think Vancouver police out of 62,000 only charged two to go to Rima, many, many more uh, people. So we've got de facto de de decriminalization based on the discretion afforded to law enforcement officials, prosecutors, and judges uh, right now. So uh, and that's why I switch from decriminalization because the criminal organizations, these gangs that are making profit, that are killing people and shooting people and, and bringing the profits back from the United States in the form of cocaine and guns, creating more havoc on our streets, uh, are the ones that are going to still profit from it. That's why I've gone regulation. We might as well. We're not going to stop the use. The use has been actually consistent for marijuana for quite some time. It's about 28 to 30 percent of Canadian population has used marijuana, and about 11 up to 13 percent continue to use marijuana on a regular basis. That's quite a domestic market you have, and that hasn't really fluctuated too much in the last little while. So uh, I'm trying to be as real as, as possible and say, hey, yeah, maybe we need to change that, but I'm keeping my focus on what needs to be done here. Right, just make sure that you don't regulate it wrong. <laughs> hey, I doubt that we will. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Jeremiah Vandermeer. I'm the editor of Cannabis Culture Magazine, Mark Emery's Cannabis Culture Magazine, and Pot TV. Question for Mr. Heed regarding the Sensible BC campaign, which I, I'm assuming you've heard about. And for those who haven't, the Sensible BC campaign is a ballot initiative campaign here in the province, like the HST ballot initiative, um, and it's being spearheaded by the former editor of Cannabis Culture, Dana Larson. And if it gets enough signatures, it will go onto the ballot. And what the question actually asked is if the people of BC would like to defund policing for the possession of small marijuana, so possession of small amounts under an ounce of marijuana. And that would effectively decriminalize it here in the province. Now, I actually have a quote here from the Shirley Bond, the Attorney General and Justice Minister, that she said to me, I haven't published this yet, um, but she says that police are constitutionally required to enforce the rule of law until and unless Canadian law is changed, the production, sale, and use of marijuana is currently illegal, controlled federal legislation, and our police have a responsibility to enforce criminal laws for the good of all British Columbians. Now, you're a former police chief. The Sensible BC initiative, will that fly? And it, that's, it's totally legal. It's already been approved by the province. So why is the Attorney General saying that it's federal law when really we know we can defund it legally? And I'd just like your comments on that. Can we defund this legally? Well, certainly if you look at the Constitution Act, the way the responsibilities are divided up, uh, within Canada, of course, you know, federally they're responsible for certain things. But the administration of justice here in the province of British Columbia is controlled by the provincial government. So we control the court system, we control the law enforcement, all of that stuff. Uh, so, you know, I've taken uh, a different position than the minister previously, and I'll continue to take a different position here. Uh, discretion is inherent 
uh, in all of our criminal justice system. I, as a police officer, exercised my appropriate discretion, uh, or I did continually, uh, prosecutors did, judges uh, certainly did. If we did not exercise that discretion and went by the rule of law, I can tell you one thing, the whole system would collapse. When you look at what uh, the amount of uh, criminal charges that get processed, only 10% of them actually go to trial. A lot of them are plea bargained off or you know, some other loop is taken versus trial. Now, if you followed the rule of law, first of all, the police officers that are working at 312 Main would not get more than two or three blocks because they would be arresting everyone or uh, a lot of people. And you think they were bogged down in paperwork before, you've seen nothing if you follow the rule of law. So when we have people making those destructive comments and trying to influence people, uh, I find that quite disturbing. I think we have to be realistic, we have to be practical, we have to understand discretion will continue to be applied by not only police, but prosecutors, judges, and even correction officials. Mm -hmm. And just a quick follow-up, you were talking about de facto decriminalization here in the province, and I think it relates to what your answer is there, um, because you mentioned that there's only been a few cases of possession charges here in Vancouver. I think there were six in 2011. But the rest of the province of British Columbia, as you mentioned, has a whole hell of a lot. And actually, it's more than the rest of, or the, rest of the country. We have more arrests for small possession here than the rest of the country. So every single year. So it's, you know, there's that disparity where Vancouver does one thing and the rest of the province does something else. Michael, just another quick question. Do, where do these marching orders come from? <laughs> Here's my other rant. <laughs> yeah. um, I've been asking for reforms to policing here in the province of British Columbia for quite some time, and I continue to. You know, I'm, uh, I'm one of municipal police, and I'm one of local accountability, local governments in policing here. We know what happens outside of Vancouver. We know that they're controlled by a completely different system. And, uh, you know, I've been advocating for that unified police service for quite some time. If you have a chief constable, who, you know, through his, the policies within the organization can determine that we're going to exercise our discretion and not charge people for simple possession of not only marijuana. If you recall, in 2002, in front of Pierre Nolan and his commission here, I made that uh, remark that we are not pursuing people for simple possession for any drugs unless they're extenuating circumstances. We saw what was on the front page of the Sun newspaper the next day, and I was dragged into the chief constable's office. Terry Blythe at that time, and Terry supported me, saying, what did you mean by this? I said, I'm just telling them what we've been doing for quite, quite a few years now. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's a different police service you have outside of Vancouver, so that may address some of the discrepancies in charging people for simple possession. It's odd that in the last 10 years it's gone up by 100% the arrest in this province. 100%. Uh, we, this woman here had a comment. Yes, did you? Oh, oh, sorry. Um, back to the um, American situation, because it does dictate very largely how we, the speed at which we proceed. Um, do, do the American states have more uh, power and, and yeah, power um, in their relationship with their federal government? for instance, than we do. Um, because Colorado and Washington State have apparently said, well, we're going to do it differently and Washington up yours. Um, but the Obama, a democratic administration is playing it cool, will not last, you know, because the moment is a Republican in the attitude, or Obama, uh, the attitude in Washington, D.C. will change. Yeah. But do you think, when that attitude changes, that Washington and Colorado will still say, up your way, we're going a different route? Um, are they stronger than our provinces are in relation to the best? Got it. So the question is, are American states uh, more more powerful vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the American federal government than Canadian uh, provinces are with the Canadian federal government, and uh, will they be able to uh, their choice? Will, will Washington State and Colorado be able to prevail with their voters' choices? 
I think you need a constitutional lawyer in the uh, audience. We're going to find out how powerful states are, uh, depending on what Washington does in this situation. Um, I'm sure the you know the, the, the huge drug war bureaucracy that still exists in Washington, and they've been churning away under Obama, uh, fighting the drug war globally. So there's huge debates going on in Washington right now. I'd like to think that Obama's going to let this go, but what are, what are the precedents? Uh, what are the other precedents, legal precedents, for states doing other things that we may not be in favor of? Um, so I think it's a very, very big constitutional issue in the states. Um, so I, 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 I'm uncomfortable you know, answering that. Obviously, there's a difference. It seems that states have more powers. But until uh, there was an issue around guns and gun control that came up that really paralleled, what if a, what if a state decided this about guns? What would Washington do? So the issue isn't about cannabis, really. It's about the state power, federal power. And sometimes these issues get, get decided not on the substance of whether it's cannabis, but on what, what are the precedents for states doing other things that could be actually quite uh, destructive. Um, that's as far as I go without knowing the constitutional. In, excuse me. In, in the states, I'm an American, so I know a bit about it. In the states, criminal law is largely a state matter. That's why you have some states that execute and other states don't. Or for different countries, mm -hmm. the states have much more say. That's why they, in, the, in America you get the notion of, well, it's a federal offense. Because most right. offenses are state offenses. Or in, in Canada, criminal law is a, is a country one. Uh, there's a gentleman back to a comment or a question. Yeah, I'm just wondering. So I like to think of myself as, as a numbers guy. Um, I'm wondering, what is the scale of the avoided costs that we can anticipate from, from getting rid of prohibition? Good. So the, the, you know, not only the costs of enforcement and, and that kind of thing, but the societal and social losses from the violence and gang activity and that kind of thing. We have um, what kind of benefits will we receive from the program. We haven't talked much about the numbers, and economics is one of the uh, important things. The study that, uh, the economic study that was done was uh, part of what generated uh, this uh, uh, this topic. So, but your question is kind of the reverse of what the amount coming in from cannabis, cannabis might be. What you're asking is, what would be the avoided cost of continuing to prohibit uh, use? Well, yeah, if, what, are, what, are, what are the avoided costs if we go with prohibition? I mean, what kind of benefits are we talking about? What, what kind of scale? If, if we get rid of prohibition? Yeah, if we get rid of prohibition. Um, I, I don't have, I don't know. I mean, it's underground, I mean, so I appreciate it. It's, it's obviously a significant. Billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. Yeah. Billions. I mean, it's a significant amount of money. Um, I can't think off the top of my head. Most of the cost-benefit studies have looked at uh, tax revenues, those sorts of things. There's a guy in the state, what's his name, who's done a lot of work on this. He's, uh, oh, I can't remember his name. Um, Jeffrey Muron. Sorry? Jeffrey Muron. Yeah, Jeffrey Muron has done a lot of the economist, and he's looked at, at this issue a lot. And it, it, I mean, it's obvious if you look at the prison industrial complex in the, in the states, it's fed. You know, Forty percent of inmates are in there because of drug offenses, low-level drug offenses. Yeah, so, it. Uh, I'm sure the numbers are there, but it's it's a, it's a massive amount of uh, expenditures and cash. And speak to policing costs. Our justice minister is worried about the unsustainability of policing costs. So why are we having police spend any time on this issue? Yeah, it, it, it's, you, you would have to do an incredible amount of analysis, but let's just talk about some of the general things that are out there right now. First of all, the GDP for marijuana in British Columbia is about 2.6 to 2.8%, which is larger than forestry and fishing combined with lots of cash coming. Unbelievable. Uh, I know in the Economist article, they worked off $7 billion uh, as a very conservative estimate here. I work off of $8 billion based on some of my calculations some of the talks I do on the industry here in British Columbia. That's that we know of, and that's based mainly on some of the statistical data taken from police departments on interdiction of marijuana here in the province of British Columbia. So it is significant, but take into account 
the fact that you can now take that, that tax revenue, if we ta regulate and tax it, we can now take that tax revenue, like I mentioned earlier, and earmark it for some badly needed programs here in British Columbia. Number one is what we do on preventing kids from getting involved in drugs to begin with, to get involved in gang violence, to be, you know, all of that stuff, and health costs that, that needs to be done. The other part of it is law enforcement, okay? You will now be able to free up law enforcement resources, whether it just be financial or personnel hours, to focus on some significant crimes that really affect society. The shootings that are taking place throughout uh, British Columbia, and these murders that are taking place, you know, law enforcement, believe it or not, has had very little success in arresting people that are committing these uh, gang murders right now. Very little success in arresting them. You need to move them. You need to think along those lines. So all the resources that are freed up to prison. The people that are, are locked up in prison for marijuana right now. Remove, you know, it's really no thing. So when you, when you take into account all of that, you can see that there is a significant, I won't call it cost savings, but a significant redistribution of funds that can really go into those areas that affect society and help society in general. That's the closest I can cover. 75% of all federal prosecution time and resources are spent on drug cases. 75%. So that's drug prohibition for you, costing us millions of dollars out of our pockets and into our debt personally every single day. My thought is just that that's the, you know, there's the, the moral kind of issues going back to work. That's an issue that you can get some of these you know, traction with. Okay, this gentleman here has his hand up for the longest time. So oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I want to find out uh, the medical issue, yes. the health issue. Uh, we know nicotine is bad. We know we've been told that a little bit of alcohol is really good for you. A little bit more is okay. A little bit more is a dangerous path. Where does marijuana come in? Uh, except for the medical portion of it, which I'm not interested in, the social issue of Marion. Can you comment on that? Sorry that you're concerned about the... The, the question is, uh, the, the question is, uh, what are the, uh, the medical downsides or the potential medical downsides of mar or upsides of marijuana use? Uh, we know that uh, alcohol has a gradation of value to, uh, to risk, depending upon uh, quantity. Is that true also of marijuana? Well, you know, I'm not an expert in this, this area, but part of the problem with prohibition of cannabis is that we have not been able to do a lot of research. There's more research starting to happen now. Uh, there's more research on the benefits of cannabis. Um, I, I think we all know people who, who are, uh, smoke too much cannabis. Uh, there's, there's obvious problems. It, it's, it's not a benign substance. I don't agree with the contingent that doesn't see any problems with cannabis. But there's not a lot of good research. Most of the research involves very, very heavy use. Animal studies, uh, heavy uh, use of cannabis. So there's not, a, there's not a rich research around the harms of cannabis. Um, and that's been one of the downsides of prohibition. We haven't been able to study it. And both both harms and benefits. Thank you. OK. With that, I'm sorry. It's 1.30. We always stop exactly on time. Thank you for your question.